Open door, open heart. Hi, I'm Jules. I'm a cat volunteer here at the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter. We are here today to learn about the Cat TLC program here. By the way, this is Alex. I named him, he's one of my foster kittens. I named him for the great Alex Honnold, who is an amazing rock climber. So the reason for our Cat TLC program here at the shelter is because it makes a really big difference in the cat's health and well-being and their adoptability. There are four kind of main things besides that that our program works with. The first is mental and physical enrichment for the animals in our care. It helps them stay healthier and happier and less stressed. And in that, they're actually easier to adopt. The second point of a cat TLC program here at the shelter is to help cats who need extra socialization become more confident, more social, and that helps them get adopted and more easily transition into their new adopted home. The third point for the cat TLC program at the shelter is to provide uh, behavioral and medical observations to staff so that we can make sure the cats are getting optimal care here. For example, I brought this guy in today because this morning he was really lethargic and this guy is a high energy kitten. So when I came in I let the staff know that he's not feeling himself. And that's what we do here at the shelter as well. If we notice differences in behavior or if we notice a scratch or something like that, we want to let staff know right away so that the cat can be properly cared for. Finally, volunteers assist with things like laundry, dishes, which includes cat toys, and other miscellaneous things, which contribute to the well-being of the overall cat program here at the shelter. Next, we want to talk about how our shelter encourages us to interact with cats. And the approach is called LIMA, which stands for Least Invasive, Minimally Aversive. So the purpose of following LIMA here at the shelter is because we want to give the cats as much choice as possible and that means we want to interact with them with the least possible use of force, restraint, and stress. So what that looks like when we interact with cats here is that we don't use punishment. But that's been found to not be an effective way of conditioning cats or even interacting. So what we do is we, we reward positive behavior and we let the negative go. We just don't pay attention to it, which is a non-reinforcer actually. How we can reward behavior is giving treats or we can pet or play. Play is a great reinforcer, um, especially for young kittens. Another way Lima informs our interactions with cats is that volunteers do not scruff. Some staff may scruff from time to time, but it's not a common thing and it's, um, it's not something volunteers have been trained to do. Also, there's a thought that mothers use it, mother cats use it to maybe punish or to um, kind of tell their kittens what to do or not do, and that's actually not true. Mother cats pick their kittens up by the scruff to move them, but it's not at all a behavior modification thing. And remember, cats know that humans are not cats, so we are not doing a natural thing. So scruffing takes away their choice and it adds stress, so we don't want to do it. Keep in mind that volunteers who do not abide by these shelter policies will be asked to discontinue volunteering. There's a lot going on at the shelter, and it kind of can ebb and flow throughout the day. Sometimes we're slammed, other times it's a little quieter, but you never know. In the summer, we tend to be busier, so um, you can see the cat room is a busy or is is surrounded by all kinds of activity. So for us to be conscious of all these ways that they get stimulated, 
helps us interact with them more consciously and to make some better choices at times. A few things to be aware of before you start interacting with cats is that, and probably most of you actually already know this, they're very sensitive to sound, to smells, and to visuals. And um, with smells, we ask that you not wear perfumes or colognes before you come in, also essential oils. We also um, be aware of if you have strong smelling hair products. One time a volunteer came in and they had no scent on but I could smell them from several feet away and it was hair stuff. And another smell that we encounter here thanks to um, our recent bout of experience with COVID is hand sanitizer. So if you use that here while you're at the shelter, please just um, uh, rinse off your hands before interacting with cats because it has a really strong smell. So go ahead and get rid of that smell so they're not freaked out by it. So just really be aware of things that you maybe use normally that you're not aware of the smell and just um, wait to use those till you get home. Next we have sound. Look at this guy. Um, so cats are really sensitive to sound and I am too and so I, I like a nice quiet cat room. So we use our library voice and we, um, we don't want to clang the, uh, the kennel door is shut. You know, it happens sometimes, but we want to close it like with two hands um, rather than just pushing it closed or banging it closed. And also, um, sometimes people come into the room and they just have loud voices. Or, and that's both sometimes volunteers and the public. So it is okay to just extremely politely, you know, mention that cats are really sensitive to sound and ask them if they can just speak a little more quietly. Another thing that used to happen, I don't know, we've had changes due to COVID, and I don't know if we're gonna go back to some ways that we used to do things, but people used to be able to come in the cat room and look around and look at all the cats and kind of have interactions with them. It was very sweet actually. And um, sometimes though, people would like be banging or knocking on the kennel um, doors, um, sticking fingers in, um, and just, and like, or kids would be coming in and getting really amped up because of all the cute kitties. And so they'd be running around and kind of screaming. So again, it's okay to just, again, ask them to use their inside voices, tell them that cats get really scared of loud sounds. Also, sometimes this, the cat room is in the middle of all kinds of activity in the shelter. So if there are dogs barking a lot outside the room, you know, there are going to be dogs barking sometimes, periodically. But if it's going on and on, we can go out and ask client services if there's another option for maybe having the dog go outside for a little while. Um, there's also a loud cart that goes down the hall at least once or twice a day. That's just incredibly loud, but again, it's, it's a one-off. And in some ways, it's okay for the cats to be exposed to some loud sounds because it helps them see that, oh, that's really uncomfortable, but I'm still okay. So it does help to kind of condition them and stretch them just the way we all need stretching. So the last one is visuals. And that can include like the kids running around like we just talked about. It can include like wild movements by us or people. So we really want to be aware of what we're doing and what we're communicating with our whole body when we're in the cat room. We also, um, if you are opening a cubby to just like see where the cat is, um, you know, think about like the cubbies are in the kennels are really dark, which is great for the cats, but if we open them suddenly and all the way, um, the light just blasts them. So that's not very comfortable for them. So if you have to open it, just open it a little bit of a way so you can see where the cat is and then, you know, again, close it again. And again, always being super polite to people and compassionate and it's like, I know your kids, what else can you do? But, or, you know, some way of acknowledging that it's a, might be a challenge for them to change their behavior. Welcome to your new home. This is the cat station here at the shelter. I have already gone and signed in on the computer near the volunteer coordinator's desk or office. And I have my, I have my apron on, my name tag, my pen, and now I come to the cat station. And the first stop is the whiteboard. Staff and volunteers can make notes on the whiteboard. This side is for medical things. 
So I actually wrote something about one of our cats, Ratani. Sometimes does loud, rather urgent meows, sometimes before using litter box, other times not sure why. And then I, so I put the date, his kennel number, his name, what I noticed, and my, my name. So sometimes, you know, this can be, a, a, or meowing while using a litter box can be a sign of something. So, but I don't have the medical information to know that. So I put it here. Staff will check that out and see if there's something we need to be concerned about. And some other people have noticed or noted a couple other things like diarrhea, which especially in kittens is really, really important to, uh, to note that because, yeah, it's really bad in kittens to have lots of diarrhea. Next side of the board is for behavior, think behavior issues that we've noticed. And um, so again, the first one is May 20th, kennel number, name, Petrie, can get a little mouthy, especially when getting pet, or getting pets, gets caught up in the moment. So um, that's not necessarily uncommon. We have some cats who kind of overstimulate easily. We want to tell other volunteers about that so that we can work with them appropriately. And that's the other reason we're not on our phones, but always watching what the cat is doing. Are they getting a little overstimulated? Okay, we need to stop all stimulation, like no more petting, nothing like that. Usually just a few seconds is enough. And then we can go back again, but we're always watching what the cat is doing. So it's essential to read both sides every day. If we notice a medical thing one day, that has already been put on the board, we generally don't have to make a note of it again. If it's maybe a week later and I'm still noticing something, I might make a note, but we don't need to notice it like every day because staff is getting to it and probably has already checked it out. So this is essential. It can look the same for a while, but just get into the habit of reading this every day just to make sure you're not, um, you're not missing something. It's easy to do. And then we come on back here. The next thing we do is wash our hands. As if we were doing the COVID shutdown. So they say about 20 seconds. Elton Brown actually has a great video. He knocks us down. We do the fronts. We do the backs. Backs. We do in between. We do like up and around the tips where the nails are. And usually I try to sing a song or something while I do this so I know I get the full 20 seconds. If I've been working with other cats, then I make sure I wash my arms too, unless I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt. And then it. And you want to like rub all that stuff into the sink so that it so that it goes down the drain rather than staying on our bodies. have towels here. All right, and then of course the waste basket, waste basket is at the down at the beginning of the cat station, so I'll do this in a minute. Now while we're here, let's just find out what is here. We have little towels, which may be needed for certain things. We have orange aprons, and we'll talk about those later. We have lots and lots of treats. So I like to load up on some treats for my shift when I come in. And I don't want to do too many. Treats are a very useful tool for us. Oh, and on this side we have bags that are already open. This side we have new unopened bags. We have these softer pounce ones for older kitties. And party mix is very popular. Um, and probably not going to use that many. The really great thing about party mix is how easily they break into pieces. So I've got one treat. Now I've got two. Whoops. Now I've got three. And now I've got four. So we, um, like I said, treats really are very uh, useful tools for us when we're working with the cats and just being with them but they also have downsides. 
they can cause diarrhea. We especially, as I just said, want to watch. Um, we don't want to encourage the formation of diarrhea with the kittens um, because that is a real health, health issue with them. Also, the longer a cat is here, the less exercise it's getting. Even if we're, we're working with the cat like once a day, they're still not like, getting out of that kennel for most of the most of the 24 hours of the day. So giving them smaller treats, they don't know that we broke a bigger treat down into a smaller one. Um, but giving it smaller ones will help keep them from putting on weight or as much weight. We have miscellaneous office supply kinds of things here. And then here if we need paper, tape, scissors, um, new kennel cards, we'll talk about these later. And then we have the toy drawers. Lots and lots of toys. Mice are always good. Let me take a couple of those. And I love like cloth balls, fluffy balls, and um, ping pong balls or other light balls. Another toy drawer down here. Another toy drawer here. And here. And yes, we um, we can go through them all by the end of the season, especially kitten season. And then in the top drawer we have grooming supplies. So, oh, and wand, wand toys are here in this bucket on the counter. So, welcome home. Welcome to the Adoptable Cancer. This is your second home. And it connects to the cat station right through that door in the back of the room. So you can see it's a big room. There are kennels all the way around. We got these gorgeous new kennels a few years ago. And they're great for a lot of reasons, except that they can be noisy. So one thing we want to do is to move slowly and carefully in the room and, not, and try not to bang on the kennels. But of course, we don't do that sometimes. So the other part of the room is we have these, we call them gars, for get acquainted rooms. And this first one, you can see we know what to do in this room. We can bring adult cats in here. They're not really adults, but seven months and up. That means basically that their immune systems are in pretty good shape. So they can come in here, and we can bring successive adult cats in here during the day. They're cleaned the next morning by staff, so we don't have to worry about things communicating too much. This is the kitten room, and this is for six months and under. And the reason we want to keep them separate is because kittens are, their immune systems are still developing and they're susceptible to a lot of things. It's partly why they may be susceptible to diarrhea as well as other things. So to keep, optimize their well-being and keep them safe, we want to, um, or as safe as possible, we want to keep kittens in this room only. And finally, we have what's called a URI room. URI stands for Upper Respiratory Infection. The parts of a kennel are, I should just show you again. There's this latch here, which goes over these two bars. And a, a few of the um, kennels aren't like, quite in true, so you have to really um, push in the door and then lift these up again quietly as possible and open it all the way up. There's a water bowl, there's a food bowl. Depending on the kind of cat, there may be um, wet food bowls or other things. We try to include some stimulation for Katie's. So we have things like that. Sometimes we guess right, sometimes we don't. It, a nice ball is good. For kittens, they like balls that are noisy. They also can like balls that are less noisy. Um, I like to give them a, a mouse too. So somehow they know even though they maybe have never seen one, so probably know what a mouse is. So that can be a great toy, especially with feathers. Those are awesome. Um, we have a bed or some kind of softness for them. We have, again, something to keep the floor warm. And then in these cubbies, you know, I think of this as like the living room. This is who's in, these, um, in this kennel, and we have in these two cubbies. So one is a bedroom and one is a bathroom, to put it simply. Okay, we want to open them slowly, and most of the time we try not to open them. And so right now, one of the kittens in this group 
And this batch is here. I don't know if that's pop or tart. Hello, beautiful. <laughs> and then just close them again like the other room. Just um, pushing that button. And then there's a litter box in this one. You can see. So if there's a kitten who really wants to be in one of these cubbies, we try to just let them be there and not bother them. We try to do TLC interactions in the main part of the kennel. Every once in a while, a cat or a kitten doesn't want to come out of the cubby, and every once in a while it's okay to do TLC in the cubby. But we start in the main one first. Oh, and what we don't have here is a wand toy. A wand toy is a way of interacting with the kitten or cat from a distance, so it's less threatening than my just sticking my hand back there. So, like in the strays room, we have these, um, these circles, which are, some of them are in, are in better shape than others, some aren't doing too well. So we um, can actually close off a, one of the cubbies by just rolling these things up and over, and then there are little things over here to catch it. So again, if staff is trying to clean the kennel and there's a kitten in here and they don't want it to jump into the main part, and jump out, which they really like to do. Um, we can just kind of close them off temporarily that way, or sometimes if a kitten is going home or a cat is going home and there's another animal in the kennel, then it's just easier to block them off again for the same reasons. And then we just put this back so, um, so the cat can access either their bedroom or, in, or their litter box. And so it is really important to double check and remember to um, unblock the portal if you've locked one temporarily so that they can get to litter boxes and important things like that. We talked about the GARS as a place that we can bring cats and kittens to play and to socialize with them. We also use the GARS as temporary housing instead of putting um, a cat or kittens in a kennel. Maybe these guys weren't doing well in the kennel so we want them to have a more home-like environment so here they have more space to run around and play and just be. And so you can tell that this isn't a regular guard because it has the names of the kittens and these, um, these kennel cards um, on the door. And then the TLC card is next to that. So we just um, go in as normal um, and play, pet, and again, sometimes under-socialized cats or kittens are in a gar to help them feel more comfortable. So again, as always, we go slow, as we do with fearful cats, and just we, we take their temperature and act accordingly. After we see who we're going to interact with for the day, we want to just check out the environment. One thing we look for is signs. So in this case, we've got arrows. Actually, this arrow should be pointing up. And that lets us know that there's a passageway from this top kennel to this next kennel. And in the case of Petri, there's another one from, <laughs> he's so adorable. <laughs> there's another one in the back there to down to this kennel. So when we have space and when we have a big cat or a cat who might be here for a while, we like to give them extra kennel space. Some other signs you'll see is shy. Um, sanitized, obvious, and I'm adopted. Sometimes it also signs that say on hold, and that means that that kitten may be adopted, or cat may be adopted, and then there also can be signs like high energy or URI, and sometimes other signs that say no TLC today, and then we just don't do TLC that day on that cat. Welcome to the Lost and Found room. And it says Lost and Found right here. To make things interesting, we also call it strays. And we probably call it strays more often than Lost and Found. That's because we have, this is the first room where animals are typically housed if we think they'll be adoptable. So oftentimes they're strays, sometimes um, people have brought them in, sometimes their owner surrenders in here and um, usually animals in here are on a hold wait while we wait to see if someone will claim them. They do not officially belong to the shelter yet and so we're holding them so that hopefully their regular humans can find them and 
and take them home. The other thing that we have is, for example, we've got a nursing mom with babies, and so we give her a lot of privacy, and this is a space where we can hold her until they go to foster. Usually we try to send out tiny kittens and nursing moms off to a foster home until they're ready for adoption. So um, usually regular volunteers do not come in this room. The exception is, is kitten season, when we have a lot of cats and kittens and coming in. So um, normally you can see what the kennel card looks like for this guy. He's not available to be um, petted by um, regular volunteers. There are some senior volunteers who, um, who have special training who can. Um, if it seems appropriate. There are times in here where you will see staff only, and in that case, even the senior volunteers are not supposed to interact with that cat. The other reason sometimes we have cats in here is because they're on kind of a clinic hold, and we want to monitor their health and well-being and make sure that they're okay and going to be okay before we either send them to the adoptables room or before we send them home to a foster. The other thing about this room, this room houses our old um, kennels. Uh, as you saw in the adoptables room, we have those fancy new kennels, but these are the old ones. And so we just open, we've got two cubbies. We've got the main kennel, which is here. And one nice thing is if you're ever having to separate out some kittens or something, you can pull this out and separate out one kitten or cat here and have another one here so you can get them without losing all of these guys. They love to jump out. Um, so that's a handy feature of how these kennels work. And then you just push in the button again to close them. And regular volunteers do often come in here during kitten season or during our busy times, which is kitten season, which is usually kind of like end of May, June, into November. And we just, basically this room is also overflow in those cases. So there will be adoptable kittens. If the adoptables room fills up, we'll have adoptable cats and our kittens in this room too. And there will be a sign on the door that says, adoptable cats in this room, please come on in and um, visit them, or something like that. So, um, you'll just go and look here. We don't have any right now, but there's a green sign that says adoptable, and you can play with any of those. So right now we don't have any overflows in here right now. We just have, it looks like medical holes and um, waiting for fosters, and then just some of the new cats. We have a new guy who just moved in here who's pretty scared. And one reason we don't just have lots of people coming into this room is we want to keep it quiet for poor moms who are nursing and for the new cats. They're pretty stressed. It's a stressful place for a cat. So we want to just keep this room kind of quiet and chill so everyone can be as undisturbed as possible. Some of our cats are in quarantine. This little guy, I don't know if it's because they bit someone. It's a tiny kitten. Um, but they do have sharp teeth still. Um, or if because it could be quarantined for a ringworm. So when we see a quarantine sign, we just walk on by and let the poor kitty serve out its quarantine sentence and the staff will interact with the, with the cat or kitten, but volunteers do not. So we want to make sure that you know that it, when animals are surrendered or come into the shelter as strays, that we make every effort possible to find their humans. And um, this room is kind of a holding station for cats who we hope their humans will find them here um, until they actually belong to the shelter and we can hopefully adopt them. So if they come in without identification, um, yes, no identification, that means no microchip or having a collar with tags, we hold them for five days or about a week because we usually don't count the first or the last day of the hold. And after that point, if no one has claimed them, then we can, if they're in good enough shape for adoption, we'll often move, we usually move them into adoptables so that they can be adopted. Um, if they need extra time to chill, 
then we give that to them here, sometimes next door, but also here. If they come in with identification, we hold them for eight days. Again, just to, we're trying to reach their, their regular humans, we can give them time to get here to get them, and we don't want to adopt a cat out who's actually belongs to someone and they're trying to get here to get the cat. So um, again, they're held here for about eight days until we make them adoptable. Sometimes we need to get extra bedding, extra towels for kennels or for the guards. Um, I came in this morning and this little guy had spilled his whole water bowl on his towel, so I went to the laundry area to get a new towel for him. And the way we get there is we go through the cat station. This is the laundry area. We've got beds over there, blankets, we've got all kinds of towels, different sizes, rugs. I love putting rugs down on the floors and the guards. And this is where also we help out. We can help out with washing, there's always folding to do. And everywhere we put things is just right here. So it's super simple and it's kind of noisy. So we can close this too. And then we have the dishwashing area which is where we can also find cat toys. So we've got a couple of wand toys that they hang up here to dry. And there may also be toys here. We can take them back to the cat station with us. Um, all toys and dishes and litter boxes and everything go through this sterilizer. When you have used laundry, if you're wearing an orange URI apron, this isn't an orange URI apron, but if you have used laundry of any kind, we don't put it into another kennel. We don't put them in used laundry from a kennel into a gar. Um, we want to keep any possible diseases strictly separated from other cats. You just put it on this pile, and it's this big like every day. So the laundry is really one of the most important things that happens here. Okay, so we have washed our hands. We've checked the whiteboard. We've got some treats. We've got our pen and our phone. So we come into the cat room, ready to enter the joy of feline furry love. And there are all these candles. What on earth do we do first? Luckily, there's a good answer to that. Our goal here is to see each cat at least once a day. If we have time and enough volunteers coming in, we can visit them as many times as we want, unless of course they're, they need more space. But what we do when we come in, all of us, is we just flip up the kennel card with the cute little pictures on, and we look at the TLC card. And I look at the last date they were visited. In this case, Sycamore was visited yesterday. So that means he's, um, he's scheduled to be seen today. So, I keep in mind that he needs to be seen. Next with Pop and Tart, oh, we have kittens. And same thing, Pop and Tart were seen yesterday, so they're scheduled, they need to be seen today as well. So then we come over to the next kennel, also seen yesterday, need a visit today. And we do that for the whole room, or if you have a memory like mine, we maybe do it for half the room so that we can get a good sense of who I need to be visiting. It's not bad actually to check all the cards. Every once in a while we don't have um, enough volunteers or there's something that happens so that not everyone was seen the day before. So if someone hasn't been seen for say two days, then my priority is to see them first. And this guy's already been seen today a couple times. So he gets a pass from me and um, yeah, then just go around and that helps me orient what my shift is going to look like. When we come into the cat room this time of year, kitten time, um, it's, it's really hard not to want to play with all the kittens because they are so fun and they're just so adorable. But in reality, they move up the door pretty darn fast, um, especially since COVID, frankly. Um, so when you come in, 
prioritize working with the older cats, and in this case we're talking about six months can be an older cat. They are going to be here longer than the adorable two-month-old kittens. This guy is two years. What are his chances of being adopted and getting out of here in the near future? Probably not really great. So prioritize these guys. They need the attention more. The kittens do need to work off energy, but if they're in a kennel with their siblings, at least they have their siblings to work off energy with. So have compassion for these lovely older guys. So when I have kittens or cats who are really right at the edge of the kennel and they are looking interested in what's outside the kennel, they're not huddling toward the back, they're not kind of looking fearful about what's going on out here, but they look interested. Well, Maple wants to eat, but Pine is like, ooh, I could jump out and play. That would be all right. So I have a pretty good sense that these guys would probably be interested in coming out. So let's see. Hi, do you want to come out? So this guy's ready to go. And Maple will be the same way. Now we have another cat across the room who's a little more, there you go, sweetheart. Thanks for being our demo kitten. And he's a little more sedate. And I just need to go and wash my hands before I touch the next guy. So since Petri is being pretty chill, lounge cat, I don't automatically see that he's necessarily asking to come out. Looks like he's fine with being interacted with in kennel. And frankly too, you know, when we have more cats and more volunteers, sometimes we only have three guards. So sometimes we have to do in kennel TLC. So it's not that it's wrong or bad or, or less than. But um, given the way he's kind of leaning over his, his bed, I'm thinking maybe he's interested in coming out. But he's also, he's also a big guy. Oh, what is love boy. Some cats just want lots of love and they're happy to do it in their kennel. We have an influx, a huge influx of kittens every year during the warm months. You've heard about um, cats going into heat, that's related to the time of year and the temperature outside. So they start having kittens. And um, right now we have 82 kittens in foster. And actually, the num because of the number of kittens we, we, we get every year, um, we think we completely agree with the county spay-neuter mandate. There are just so many animals that come in, and some, you know, who are born outside, they don't make it, which is, that's a hard way to, that's a hard way to go. So it's a great ordinance. Um, it is the law in Santa Cruz County. And because of it, we do think that we see fewer um, births here, fewer extraneous kittens and puppies coming in than in counties that don't have an ordinance like that. So it's really good if you've got cats and dogs at home who need to be neutered or spayed. Please make an appointment um, to bring them in here, get them neutered or spayed or with your vet. Um, we have low cost services and it's, um, it's just a great service and um, it's one of the reasons that I really love our shelter here in Santa Cruz. We have the kittens in the kitten room because we don't want to have them in the gars where adult cats are. Because again, kitten immune systems are still developing. We don't want to expose them to any more than they can take and to any diseases adult cats might be able to transfer. Um, so that's why we are in the kitten gar. And the other really important thing about kittens is they seem, a two month old kitten actually kind of seems invincible. The amount of energy they have, the amount of um, maneuvers they can do when they're playing or otherwise is extraordinary. But they are tiny, they're only, a, a two month old is only usually about two pounds. So we do want to be careful with how we um, play with them. And the most important thing it's actually an any gar is to make sure we have toys in here beforehand. I like to put down some rugs so that they've got a warm space on the floor that they can go to. So interaction with kittens is pretty much always play. Every once in a while they want to cuddle, but you know they're in the kennel most of the day and they can cuddle and sleep in there. So when I bring a kitten into this room or when I'm working with them in their kennel, if I'm doing in kennel TLC, some kind of a mouse thing, they have these mouse birds 
which are great for kittens, and actually cats too love the feathers. Yes, look at that. Oh, there you go. I like a ball that makes noise. Kittens love a ball that makes noise. I don't like it, but kittens love balls that make noise. They, um, they seem to enjoy different size balls, so that we've got the big beach ball. <laughs> we've got ping pong balls, which are awesome. They move with you know barely any effort, and they have that cool bounce. Kittens are usually pretty intrigued by that. Actually, a lot of cats are. And then a fabric ball is great, or a puff ball, because they can get bat at it, and then they get stuck on their, their, their paws sometimes, and that's really fun. And then a mouse. If there are two kittens, bring in a couple of mice. There you go. And of course, a wand toy. A wand toy is essential for cats and kittens. And I often like to start with just one string. You can see there are lots of strings. I like to start with one because this is just way too much to try to track. For, again, both adults and kittens, start with one. You can add the others later, and they'll enjoy it later because they know more what's going on. Hey, what do you think? Yes, there's the same. There you go. So with kittens, they're pretty easy to play with. Cats sometimes take more subtlety, but kittens, they just see something move and they go, which is pretty fun. But we also do want to introduce them to the idea of stocking. And actually, we don't. We can just go like this sometimes in the beginning and the kittens will just chase it, although not right now. But yeah, kind of think how a mouse moves or a bird and then do that and then we stop. And just like in real, in real cat life, cats don't just jump at everything. They stop and wait, or they just wait and wait and wait. And when their intended prey takes a break, that's when they pounce. Um, so it's the same with kittens and cats. These guys are still blowing off some energy. So, um, and it's great when, there we go. Yes, and I like to show them up because we had some kittens who came in once and they didn't know to look up. So we don't want to like bang kittens in the head with a toy. Um, that's what a lot of people do. So, um, but that's not interesting. That's not what birds or mice do. We don't give catnip to, to little tinies or to adult cats in the shelter environment. That can lead to overstimulation, which isn't something we want to encourage. They've got, it's hard enough to be here without being overstimulated without any any place to run off the energy. Oh, there you go. And then one of the, we call it the mole game. One of the, um, the oh, they're not looking. So that's perfect. Um, oh, there you are. You kind of slide the, the plastic end of a wand toy underneath, yeah, underneath a rug or a towel. And this is a great game for in kennel cats and kittens too. And they just often can go really crazy. Sometimes they like it when you stick the end out. Sometimes they only like it when it's under. Or they like a combination. So this is a way to... I played with the cat in, in their kennel for half an hour one day, just doing this kind of thing. And they were, they were very, very happy. We work really hard as volunteers at the shelter to not play with our hands to not encourage cats to, or, or kittens, either one, to play with our hands. And we're always using toys as, um, as an alternative. So um, there are times with my foster kittens that I stick a little mouse, a little mouse in their mouths. This, the hard plastic end of a wand toy can be another really great thing. And you can see that they enjoy following this too. So there's so many ways to be creative with toys. And you'll find a lot of our wand toys have chewed ends. That's because it feels good to the kittens to chew on it oftentimes. So there are so many things they can chew on. We always want to give them an option. If they keep going for our fingers, our hands, our arms, just keep sticking toys in their mouths. Again, we don't punish. We give them a better option. And ultimately, by being conscious of all of these things, we have less stressed kitties. A less stressed kitty is a more relaxed kitty, a happy kitty, a fun kitty, and a much more adoptable kitty because of all those things. So, how do we pet a cat? Seems pretty obvious. And the great thing is, they give us a lot of help. They're, most cats and kittens are good at rubbing where they want it to be 
touched, and cats have all kinds of scent glands around their head, especially on their cheeks, under their ears, under the chin, and maybe even the top of the head, I just don't remember. But, um, so they're depositing their scent on us. It kind of says, you're okay? Okay, and he just gave me a little bit of a nip. So um, I'm guessing he may be an overstimulating cat. He's not too bad. That was a really gentle nip. But it tells me to take a break and to be gentle and for, to let him pet himself on my hand rather than me being active about petting him. So how do we play with an adult cat? Kittens are pretty easy. They're um, not too hard to entertain. Whereas adults, you know, they've been around the block a few times. They know what's going on with, this, with a lot of things. So you, it's partly finding the right toy. Wand toys are just awesome because you can move them and get the cat's interest moving around. And then your hand too isn't right in the way to possibly be scratched or getting bitten or nibbled. And I don't mean an aggressive bite. Um, while they're, you know, trying to bite the toy. Um, and as we spoke about with kittens, cats love to bite. They were made to bite. And they like to um, put their paws on things and maybe their, their toenails. So we just want to try to keep things interesting for them. Um, we want them to be able to catch the toy. Catching in the wild is, is what happens, at least sometimes. So those um, laser, po laser pointer toys, which are you know, great for lazy humans who want to sit on the couch and play with the toys, and I can confess to being one of those at times, um, those are ultimately really unsatisfying and frustrating to cats because they can never catch the red dot. So we want to have toys that they can catch. You can get them um, a behaviorist, Jackson Galaxy, I like a lot. He recommends, you know, if you need to use a laser um, pointer to get them going, go ahead and do that. But then transfer to physical toys where they can catch it and they can bite. Yes, and they can feel a sense of, oh, I've got it. So always end a play session with them catching the toy. Yeah. And then we can do the, the mole game, which we go underneath. Yeah. Cats have different reactions to that, but almost every cat loves it, even older cats who their play, play drive is, doesn't seem quite as strong. Now he's like not quite as engaged with this end, so let's do the other end. And these feather ends are awesome. Yeah, look at him go. Um, and then that travels around like a real prey animal would. Oh, what's that over there? And we make it kind of tricky. So, oh, that's a hidden place. Every cat kind of has their favorite kinds of toys. So sometimes it's just us finding the toy that's right for the cat or finding a fun, creative way to use it that's fun for the cat. And again, it's like, now I'm doing kind of furtive movements with the feather end because mice are furtive. Um, birds less so, but he doesn't know that this is a bird or, or a mouse. He just likes the furtive movement. And um, we don't have to let them catch the toy every time because we want to actually have this be enrichment. We want to challenge them and they don't catch things every time in the wild. So, um, so some uh, non-catching is fine, but we don't want to make it super frustrating or demoralizing. And I've, I've seen demoralized cats with play. When we play with adult cats, just like with kittens, we don't play with our hands. We don't use our fingers to go, oh, isn't that fun? See, he was actually interested because it was movement. So um, we stick to things that he can bite on safely. Good for him and good for us. And we also don't want to stick things in their faces. One of people's favorite things to do, and I admit I'm tempted at times as well, people want to just stick, the, stick a toy in their face. But it's like, what fun is that? Would we like it if someone sticks a, you know, our favorite toy in our face? No. Um, so we want to make it interesting. We want to make it play we want at the shelter. They have, most of their life is spent in this kennel. So we want to actually give them something rewarding and enriching and stimulating when they're, hey sweetie, when they're um, finally getting their playtime. So we don't stick toys in, in their face because that's not what a bird or a mouse does. So when we talk about overstimulating cats, one way that we can think about it is 
that they're balloons. And when we blow up a balloon, it gets bigger, bigger, bigger. When we put energy into a cat, their energy gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And as we've talked about, sometimes they'll just walk away. They know how to take care of themselves. Other times they haven't learned that, and they'll give us a swat, maybe a nip. Um, and that's a sign for us to take a break. So thinking of them as an energy balloon that can get bigger and bigger, to me that's a really useful image to go, oh, okay, we need to let the balloon deflate a little bit. There's so many things that actually can contribute to overstimulation. And again, usually it's worse than this. This isn't bad. My first summer here, um, we had a cat who we could pet him once, and then he was overstimulated. So this, is, this guy's easy. But just so you know, so we would pet him once, and we'd visit him several times during a shift. Poor guy, he was a sweetie though, because and mostly they are sweet. Anyway, so one thing that can contribute to um, overstimulation is when the cat room is full of people coming to look at cats, of volunteers. Um, before COVID, people used to come in and just visit the cats, and there would be kids running around the room screaming. There'd be adults talking loudly. Sometimes people would be fighting with each other. So all of that kind of stuff can lead to, can contribute to overstimulation. So as we spoke about sights and sounds and, and all of that, we want to try to um, make this as sane an environment for a cat as possible. So he's a mixed cat. He's super friendly, but he may also overstimulate. So we're really watching. Um, so with most cats, they enjoy a nice slow stroke down the back. But he is um, such a dear. He earlier when he was laying over on his side, and I would have had to like kind of go in front of his face and run my um, arm down his back. He could have grabbed onto my arm or something. So I, I watch for certain positions that can kind of el elicit um, behavior that I don't want. Right now, I can get my hand behind his head, and he's getting very snuggly. So. Um, He's a pretty awesome cat, aren't you, dear? You're a pretty awesome cat. But normally, with a cat, you want to kind of do an initial, if they're letting you pet them, do an initial, like, three second, and I shouldn't have just looked at the camera while I'm petting him. If we're petting, eyes full on the cat all the time so we can watch behavior to make sure that they're happy and we prevent any possible scratches or bites. So, um... Here you are. So anyway, when you first start meeting a cat, maybe just scratch or pet for a few seconds and then just take a little break. They're fine. If they want more, they'll reach out. We want to give them the opportunity to make the choice. So again, that's back to Lima. And now he, he started nibbling on my knuckle again, which didn't hurt a bit. Some cats, it might hurt more the next time. If his tail starts switching, you probably all already know when a dog, you know, wags its tail, that's a good sign. When a cat is wagging its tail, not a good sign. It means that the energy is building up in their body, and um, they might need to do something to release that energy. Some cats will walk away, and then some cats kind of give you a little swat, or maybe give you a little nip. And so we just want to try to not um, elicit those behaviors. We want to keep the cat as calm as possible. So when we're petting them, we want to avoid touching their tails, oops, their paws, and their bellies. We just don't do belly rubs here because we don't know how they'll react. And that can be a blessing. Whoop, okay. That's an overstimulated cat. You saw who kind of went through my arm. So um, when they have it overstim like that, then I just give them a little break. I don't just leave them, but we can just sit right here and he's, you still got a rapport and it's the companionship, but I'm not um, stimulating him more. Yeah. Typically cats who um, overstimulate are, are very friendly extroverted cats um, and they just don't have that, they just don't have an ability to control their response to the energy that builds up in their bodies from, you know, constant stimulation or frequent or too energetic of stimulation. So I'm just staying, he's, he's not much of an overstimulator, but um, I'm still being careful and still watching him and um, 
watching if he starts making a move to bite. There he just did. I wasn't looking at him. I was looking at the camera. Again, don't do what I do. One, one way we can interact with these guys is to not pet. Like here, I'm not petting. He's petting himself on my hand. So that's one way to do it. If we're in a gar, he can rub against my legs. And that's pleasurable. And we can play. Often, yeah, look at him go. So um, playing is a great thing to do with an overstimulator because they've always obviously got all that energy. So we need to get it out somehow. So these feather toys can be great. And wand toys are great with overstimulating cats because your hands can keep, your, keep their distance from those paws and from the mouth. So we get a wide variety of cats here at the shelter and they're all awesome. Um, they're just all different too. So we get the easy extrovert cats who we can just often just meet the first time and they're on us. They want to play, they want to be petted. We get the fearful and shy kitties who are like, what the heck just happened? My life was fine and now I'm in this crazy place. This is not meant to be where how a cat should live. So it's really important for us to learn how to kind of flow with that shyness and that fearfulness. So today we're going to see um, how Sunflower is feeling this morning. I don't know her, so we're just going to, I want to see where she is, so I'm just going to open this carefully and slowly. don't want to scare her. Hi, Sunflower. Hi. So, yeah, she's already going to the back of her kennel. Normally I would allow her to try to smell me, but she's like, no, I feel pretty scared. So I'm just going to go back here and pretend you don't exist. I don't blame you, sweetheart. Yeah. And she's giving me some little hisses. And that's not aggression. That's just pure defensiveness. Oh. For her to even come forward enough to sniff the treat is actually a pretty big deal. Hi. Right. Do you want to sniff a finger, too? What do you think? So we want to give them the chance to come to us. We don't want to just stick our hands in her face. All right, so, yeah, so since she didn't have a really super negative reaction, I'm just gonna try to put this treat closer to her face and just see if I get any kind of response. Yeah, she's showing a little interest, that's huge. She did not show interest when she first got here. So that's normal for them to make progress while they're here, but some just have a really hard time. So we do try to do maybe I think it'd be great if they went to foster or something. Hi. So besides treats, we can also try to play. And in the cubby, there's not a lot of room. So, hi, you want to smell that? So letting them smell is good because then they can make an informed decision about what this is and to make sure that it's safe for them. Hi there. It's just hard to get things. And so did you see her just shift more toward the back? that's a sign that she's pretty uncomfortable and she wants to be safer. Um, so yeah, she's pretty fearful. Hi, sweetie. What do you think? Is that interesting enough to play? Sometimes they are too scared to play. Sometimes they're too scared to eat a treat. So, you know, we don't inundate them with either. But just give some possibilities. But if we do a really gentle interaction with shy and fearful cats like multiple times, short, um, short interactions, but um, intermittent, then that's really the best way. We don't want to overwhelm them with too much um, scariness all at once. But um, if they kind of see over time that there are multiple visits and that they're safe each time, things can start changing. And then sometimes we do what's called a petting stick. Hi. So I don't want to stick my hands on her, but now she can just see what it feels like to be petted. So I'm going to just stop at that. I think that's plenty of stimulation for her right now. So rather than have that cubby door open, actually the best thing to do is to try to come to them through the little porthole here. Sometimes that's more effective. It's really hard to see her though, so that's sometimes why we do the cubby, but this is a less threatening way to try to interact with her. You can even, you know, kind of get your head in there and try to pet them through that, and that's a better 
way to start for many of them. And then some, it's just not going to work. Let's see what happens with Sorrel today. And she's one of our most shy cats here right now. She came from a hoarding situation and just did not have proper socialization. That's a sign that she's nervous. Yeah. Oh, that's a that's a big door open. I don't like how open the door is, even though the camera probably likes it. Because she was um, looking pretty nervous about um, the door being so open. Now she's she's huddled back in the back of her kennel more. She seemed to kind of like the pets, but um, like sweetie. But she's also pretty nervous. So I might just, she's feeling pretty, um, I think, uncomfortable with this door being open. So I wanna just stop. And so that's like, I have a plan to start as non-threateningly as possible. But then from there, I kind of go by the cat's reactions. And so she wasn't totally averse to some interaction. She's just nervous and didn't like that door. I didn't like being so exposed as that door was open. Hi. Hi, you a lovely girl. Cheek rubs. Oh, and look at him coming out. Hey, sweetie. Okay, the other part of the plan is he can go somewhere else and he chose to. <laughs> He's like, okay, there's a lot happening in this kennel. Maybe this one will be better. So, hey, sweetie. Just gonna put the street in here. Hey, sweetheart. Keep myself behind the door that's a little bit more. Boy, he's a sweetheart. He's really, really scared. But this is actually progress. So, with the shy and fearful ones, we just need to work on our patience and just kind of keep interacting with them as little, as little or as much as they want. URI stands for Upper Respiratory Infection. So basically it's like a cold that we get. It's not transferable to us or contagious to us, so it, but it is very contagious to other cats. So we have a separate room for um, URI cats, and or sometimes we call them orange cats because of the um, coloring of the signage. And we just want to make sure we don't interact with URIs and healthy cats at the same time. Well, not at the same time, but yeah, we don't want to bring any healthy cats into this room or any URI cats into that first room or the second. And the other thing is, once we have handled a URI cat, we do not handle any more healthy cats for the rest of our shift. So a lot of us wait till the end, towards like the end of our shift to interact with URI cats. And how do you know who has a URI? There's one over here, and you can see this sign could be here or it might be over here. Um, I think they're moving them over here now. So you wanna just look and see if you see an orange sign. And once you touch a cat who has this, or if you show a cat who has that orange sign, then again, you just stick to URI cats for the rest of your shift. And you go home, before you come back to the shelter, you wash your clothes, your apron, take a shower, so that we don't keep any of those germs on us and spend them the next time we come back. All right, let's say I want to interact with our URI cat, Sorrel. So, I need to do a procedure. I come back to the cat station. I want to grab one of these orange aprons. And we have different shades of orange, depending on your mood. So, I take my apron off. And 
and I really don't want to put it on the counter because we don't know what's been, what else has been there. And then I put on, <laughs> someone folded that really well. Put on the orange apron. If I have interacted with another cat, which I haven't, um, but usually I have, then I wash my hands thoroughly again. Come back in. And grab the cat, either do in kennel or take them to the gar. And so after we visited the cat, we just ride on here. But with you or I cats, I don't do that. I close the kennel door. I go and wash my hands in the cat station. When my hands are clean, then I come back and I make a note on the kennel card so that I'm not transferring any, ge any germs to the clipboard or the kennel card. Um, or this is the TLC card. Um, because this is going to be around, could be around for a while, and it could be that the cat gets over the cold, and I don't want people touching this when I've touched it with my germy hands. Sometimes we're asked to show a cat, like first thing in our, in our shift, and the cat happens to be a URI cat. So it's like we were gonna see all these other cats that we wanted to meet and help socialize. It doesn't matter, we have to just stick with URI cats once we've started. One thing that we do encounter sometimes with cats are scratches and occasionally bites. Um, bites are about 95% of them that we've had here are avoidable. If we're paying 100% of attention to the cat, and you saw me not doing that a couple of times with Petrie, um, then we can see, watch their behavior and see what might be coming. If that tail is switching, we are asking for something to happen. So what we need to, what we want to do is to really watch the cat behavior and respond accordingly. Sometimes, often, the response is to just not do anything. Just take a break, or sometimes it's to get the kennel door closed quickly. We actually complete a report on a cat or about the bite experience if that happens, if, if it draws blood. If it doesn't draw blood, then it's not considered a serious bite. However, staff still wants to hear about it, and they want to hear about scratches. What our volunteer coordinator has said is, if you get a scratch, even a small scratch, or um, a non-blood-producing um, non bite, or a non-skin-breaking bite, please go and tell a staff person what, what, what happened. And that can be any staff person. It could be client services, it could be animal care, just whatever staff person you see, grab them and say, hey, about this. And if it's more severe, then especially we want to know because it can be an indication of a medical issue or it could be um, an indication that, like, this cat, not good for families with small children or any kind of other things. And it, it's regardless of how it's stimulated, whether the cat saw another cat in the um, shelter in, in their kennel, in the other cat's kennel, or if they got scared by a noise out in the hallway or something, or if we were petting the cat and um, just hit a sore spot. And then, you know, again, especially in that case, staff wants to know about that so they can check the cat out and see, oh, is there something wrong and something happening in that area. Finally, you are not required to act with a cat that you feel nervous about. And in fact, we wouldn't want you to because the cat will pick up on that nervousness and that puts the cat on guard, could start stressing, and that could actually lead to a bite or a scratch. So if you feel afraid of a certain cat because of what you've read on the whiteboard or heard from other volunteers or maybe behavior you're observing in the kennel, that's fine. So when we take cats to the gars, we carry them using the football hold. It's really the most secure way to carry a cat. So what I like to do, the easiest way to do it, is to come up to the kennel. Middle kennels are great. Try to stick my arm. Hi there. Maybe I'll give them some pats. Try to stick my arm underneath and then just lift them up. Then I use my other hand to kind of tuck their hips between my elbow and my rib cage. And then I've got my hand underneath his chest. And so this is a pretty secure way to carry a cat. 
because he can't use his back legs for leverage to jump off my arms. This, if he tries to move forward, my hand under his um, sternum is keeping him from doing that. And then if he's a friendly boy, I can pet him. And the other great thing about petting a cat on the head while I carry them to the gar is that they may not be able to see other cats. One thing cat volunteers get to help with, if we want to, it's not required, is to help the staff with cat shows. Helping with a cat show, it just means we walk the person into the gar, um, then we get the kitty and bring it to them and um, then let them be. If they maybe don't know how to play with a cat, we can give them some coaching on how to play with a cat, saying things like, you might try it this way, is kind of a more, a less, um, threatening or obnoxious way than just um, saying, no, you should do this. So um, we, again, we're representing the shelter, so we always want to be polite and offer options rather than kind of telling people what to do. So if this guy were going to be shown, and if, if they're confident enough, we'd love to do that in the guard. So this guy, I'm going to reach in, take him out, again, football hold, his um, his, his hips are against my um, inside of my elbow and, and uh, ribs, and then I've got him underneath the sternum to prevent him from jumping forward. If you see someone interacting with a cat in a way that you don't feel comfortable about, please let a client services staff person know right away. The cats are in our care and protection, and we don't want them being harmed or scared by some people's interactions and some people you know they have their way of interacting with animals and it may not be consistent with what we think are our best practices the other thing that often happens is someone is like oh they see the picture of the cat on the website and they say oh this is our cat this is a cat for us they meet the cat and it's like nope not our cat so they want to see another cat and so what we need to do every time is to go and ask client services these people would like to see this cat, is that okay? And then client services will check to see if there's a hold or if they're already pre-adopted or anything like that, or if there are any clinic notes that they need to know about, and then we can go ahead with the show. When we're talking to people about the cats in the room, we can talk about our experience interacting with them and what we see. We are asked not to counsel or give advice. All right, yes, come I on in, and we'll get somebody to have you meet Alex. Thank you. Jules, are you free? I'm available. Great. And Jules will Alex. show you Alex. All right. All right. All right. Any you. questions, let us know. Okay. okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jules. I'm one of the volunteers here, and I can show you Alex. He is already in this room, so oh, why don't we wait. come on in, and oh, you wait. can meet him. He is the most awesome little kitten. Are you a high-energy person? Oh, oh definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Hey, Alex. This one's so cute. Hi, baby. Hi. Hi, buddy. Yeah. There you go, my love. Oh. So this is Pat. Hi. This is Alex. So his front legs are hurt. Okay. You can just pat him and get you out. Oh, yeah, my God. Oh, he always sticks. Hi, honey. Hi. You want to come live at my house? And I'll just go outside the room and you let me know if you have any questions. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Um, has he been spayed yet? Or neutered? It, I'm sorry, neutered? Um, not yet. He's still too young. But as soon as he is up to two pounds, then you can do that and you can take him home. Okay, do you know how long that might be? Might be another week. Okay. So you're probably wondering when you get to come in and play with cats. The shelter is open to volunteer shifts to play with little guys like this from 
10 in the morning until 5.45 in the evening. On holidays, sometimes those times can change, but basically that's when we can come in. When we volunteer here at the shelter, we want to make sure we are wearing the appropriate attire. And that starts with a closed-toed shoe. Then I like to wear socks because that covers the ankles. And we want pants that go down to cover the ankles. We want full coverage down there. Then we're going to come on up. Oh, and I recommend jean-like material because it resists claws a little bit better than this. Also, we wear a top with, with, that covers our midriff. Then we have our volunteer apron. And in our apron pocket, a pen is crucial. And it's hard to find pens at the shelter because they keep disappearing. So I would just bring one from home. A cell phone is really great because we can take cute pictures and videos of the cats. And we can also tell time, which, some, which can be really handy. Then we have a kitten that's optional, a name tag, and we wear a mask until the county says otherwise. Oh, and for your shirts, make sure you wear a shirt with sleeves. And we don't do tank tops, but short sleeves are fine. We do not text read or make phone calls when we are here at the shelter. We want to always have 100% of our attention on the wonderful little animal that we're interacting with because we want to really know what they're doing behavior-wise so that we can be ready for any situation. Plus, we're here for them, so we can do texting and calling and all that another time. For volunteering here, um, we ask that you um, commit to one shift a week, and that can be a two to three hour shift. If you want to come in more, please do. There is a place to sign up, and because of COVID, everything has been in flux here for the last year, including how often we come in and when, so you'll learn more about that later, and it may change, and that's just how it is these days. So we're asked a lot of questions here that we may not know the answers to. I'm asked a ton. I've learned so much, and I still don't know the answers to a lot of questions. So remember, I don't know is a very powerful response. And we don't have to. We've got staff all around us who do know or who can find out. So in this case, when um, this person asked about um, when Alex would be neutered, and I gave her an answer because he's my foster kitten, and so I know a lot about him. Um, normally, I wouldn't know. And so I would say, sorry, I don't know. Let me check with the client services or with animal care. And. It's so nice to not have to know everything here and to have a great staff support team who does and who can give us the answers that we need to find. So we always want to remember that when we're at the shelter, we are actually representing Santa Cruz County. We represent the shelter. It's been great being with you for this video today. I hope I'll see you in the cat room soon. Um, my encouragement when you're here, ask questions. Especially ask senior volunteers questions. When I was first, my first year, I asked, I was with senior volunteers almost every shift, and I was asking questions every day, and I learned so much. I mean, I came in, I thought knowing a lot about cats, I learned 100% more that first year. So ask questions, preferably not necessarily of newer people, because there's the whole interaction of cats, cat behavior, and the shelter environment. So now that you pra know practically everything about cats and cats at the shelter, the next step is to schedule a mentor session. That gives you a chance to come in here, work with an experienced volunteer, hands-on. Yes, you'll get to pick up kitties and play with them and pet them and love them up, but no kissing. All right, that's it. You did it. I'm Jules, Cat TLC volunteer, and um, this is a great place to be. Thanks for watching.